Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for this webinar. My name is Joanne from Rockflow Dynamics Europe team. As you will have seen for this series, we are pleased to welcome some of our users as guest speakers to share their T-Navigator projects with you. Today, you will hear from Anna Nilsson, Lead Reservoir Engineer at Neptune Energy. Anna is joining us today from Aberdeen to present to you Estimating Uncertainties in Integrated Reservoir Evaluation at Project Prospect Appraisal Stage. If you haven't joined one of our webinars before, just to let you know that all attendees today have been automatically muted. If you have any questions, please type them into the window in the control panel and we will answer these at the end. And I will be happy to answer your questions and I also have my colleague Diego from our technical support team on the line to answer any Teen Navigator related questions. We have permission from Neptune Energy to record the session so that will be uploaded to our YouTube channel along with all of our other webinars in due course. If you have any other questions, don't hesitate to reach out to us on asktnav at rfgyn.com. So for now, I'd like to say a big thank you to Anna and Neptune Energy for participating in this webinar and hand the controls over to you. Hello everybody, I am Anna and uh, can you see the slides, Diego? It's the wrong screen, Anna. Now? Yeah, that's it. It's not in PowerPoint. Okay, I just put it on uh, presentation mode and I start. Uh, so this uh, presentation is about a workflow and um, study that we've done with uh, together with T Navigator and is basically called estimating uncertainty in integrated reservoir evaluation at prospect and appraisal stage. And um, um, this is the study that we did on Cygnus and we evaluated some of the blocks that are on the appraisal stage south of the Cygnus. And the agenda is like, I will go through the approach of the study and I will give you a quick overview on the static and uh, modeling concept and the GIPs and dynamic initialization of um, a basically a quick overview of Cygnus field. And then we have the uncertainty evaluation and we actually use this uncertainty evaluation in the economical evaluation and decision tree. So, the approach for the study, the study was, as I mentioned, it was done in order to evaluate the commerciality of the hydrocarbon bearing blocks out of Cygnus. And, um, and the concept was to do a tie back into the main field Cygnus. And uh, basically the in the deterministic approach in the way that we used to do the stuff in, uh, in Neptune, Traditionally, the reservoir studies were not integrated and they were dealt with in silo, basically meaning that GNG, like geophysicists and geologists, they will evaluate the prospect and on another block um, that it was in interest and they will come up with the volume um, using the softwares they use like GeoX or any other uh, tools that they have and they, they will come up with a range of volumes and key uncertainties and the reservoir engineers will use these volumes and will come up with a set of profiles um, based on the volumes and the uncertainties that basically they are mainly statistic and uh, um, as a reservoir engineer we just did a material balance most of the time and that's be done because Mm, usually in this kind of environment you have like few days or a few weeks to work on so you don't have a lot of time to do a lot of uh, in-depth studies and basically in my view in our view in Neptune was that uh, the, when you do it in this way you are a set you have a set of deterministic profiles and you're using it for evaluation so you don't actually have the full view of the probabilistic approach and what's going on and what we decided to do, we used the T-Navigator Assisted History Matching and Uncertainty Tool and um, we integrated the static, the static model all the way from initial uh, stages and we run a lot of, uh, we implemented some workflows 
and um, and we uh, we did around 150 realizations or models, and we used these 150 realizations and to come up with actual reliable P90, P50, P10 profiles for this prospect rather than the deterministic ones which you usually call high, mid, I don't know, low cases. And uh, at the end, uh, I, I coupled the, because it's a subset, I back a couple of the profiles with the actual Cygnus fulfill model to account for the, any fallbacks or uh, back out fact from the other wells that they're producing for Cygnus. And I'm, we managed to work with the economists and the profiles uh, that we were generating to come up with the criteria to determine the su success in the appraisal stage, because usually you appraise wells to decide if you want to go further or not. And we actually define what would be the criteria as well. So as I said, it's on the Cygnus field. This is a map of a structure of the entire Cygnus field. Um, I'm not going to go a lot of details about Cygnus, but basically Cygnus is eight blocks. Currently, we are producing it via nine wells from one to four uh, blocks, one to four, and and they're produced from two different platforms, which are called Alpha and Bravo. And uh, it's a, basically a dry gas fuel, and I think is around six percent of uh, um, um, gas production. And gas uh, is is uh, six percent of the gas. Uh, that people use in the uh, UK is provided by Cygnus. So it's quite a big field. It's around 1.1 1. Uh, 1 TCF recovered at uh, estimation, the last estimation I know. And as I mentioned, the study was focused on the block south of Cygnus, which we call block five. And as you can see, the structure is divided in between 5A, 5B, and 5C plus D. We have already two appraisal wells in block or two exploration walls in block 5A and 5C plus D. And uh, um, this step, the walls there had different results. I mean, they both have fine gas. So we know that there's chance of having gas here according to the geologists 100%. But the problem was that, the, or the issue is that the contact in this block 5C plus D is, and 5A and the main field signals one to four the contact is different and there is also a lot of different uh, the the quality of the rock is not the same so that's why we have to understand the block that we are going for a bit more so in the dynamic model the static models that they were built they were already built in and in using a different software. So the static model was already existed and it's not, it's not built in the model designer or the uh, uh, static way that you use in T-Navigator to use it. So I had, we had to write a workflow to bring is this uh, three static uh, models that we had into, into the loop of this work. And these three models, they have different structures they have different surfaces, different fascias, and they're basically three different models which they represent the low outcome or uh, high side or base case of the model. And I didn't want to use the full field model uh, because it's uh, it's not, um, it would take a lot of time. As you can see, the, the full field model I mentioned, I quoted how many cells it is, is around for more than 1 million cells. I just extracted uh, uh, blocks that I was interested in, which was this south blocks, 5B and um, 4C plus D. And um, I did uh, focus on the study in just this south and uh, these blocks that I extracted and this sector model, knowing that, knowing that at the end I can uh, go in and couple my result and actually account for the Backout effect and a networking system in Cygnus as well. I mean, this is a hydrocarbon poor volume. Um, 
I just created Unity Navigator in the same software. And I did my, before I run into the uncertainty study, I did my evaluation on the study, the three, uh, three models that I had separately. And as you can see, uh, I've tried some walls, but based on looking at the higher carbon pore volume, we decided that we are only interested in the 5B and which is divided in two parts as well. And because there's very limited hydrocarbon in the other blocks, and we had an issue with standoff and contact because Cygnus is very thin reservoir, and we didn't think it would be an economical success to go into this part of the field for now. So we just focus on this one that is called 5B for this study. And I, as I said, we had like appraisal worlds in the block already. So I did a quick stem um, under, and to understand what type of worlds we want. Uh, Cygnus wells are the nine producing worlds are horizontal. Um, we are used to drilling horizontal wells in which are around 3000 feet in Cygnus. And I think for this block was also the best option to drill a horizontal well because it will have around uh, three times more productivity for the horizontal well and it's proven in all the other wells and it's just a slide to show you that we did this uh, study using the uh, well options and T navigator as well and we decided to go with the horizontal well a because we had the higher initial rate and b because we could mitigate any faulting on compartmentalization on the block as well And if I'm going to the uncertainty project workflow, um, basically these are the variables that we studied. And we decided on these variables, we agreed with the Spirit Energy, which is our partner and our internal team to go through and to choose these variables. And we also defined the range of variables. I didn't choose it only by myself as a reservoir engineer. We had like a big team meeting our workshop where the geologists and geophysicists were putting on input as well because we don't want to put ranges that they don't make sense. And then the variables that they go in this, they're basically the three different geological uh, realization or the static models that they were pre-built already. And we decided on the permeability multiplier to be applied because uh, we already know that there were some issues with the quality of the blocks because it was different in the left or in the west and east of the block. And we had to apply porosity multipliers because on the east of the block, we've seen some uh, cementation and we had to account for the cement, uh, if we had to account if the for the chances of cementation as well. The fault transmissibility on the fault that it was in dividing the block into, and we had um, contact uncertainty because the contact in each block is different. And that was another thing. It was the aquifer size because um, Cygnus is, quad, is in Quad 44, and most of the fields in Quad 44 has produced water in the past. Cygnus hasn't produced it yet, but we had to account for it. I um, I did main I didn't take the aquifer into the experimental design because when I did my initial uh, evaluation, uh, we didn't think that aquifer is actually is one of the main is it wasn't one of the main uncertainties or it didn't have much of an impact in the recovery factor of the block because the geological aquifer that was already built into the model it was quite big enough. And based on the parameters and the rangers, we designed the experiment. First, we designed the sensitivity analysis. And basically, this was done to understand, uh, to see the response of the models to the selected range on the uncertainty uh, variables, and uh, to make sure that we are happy with those ranges. And then we run into the Latin Harpy Cube, um, and we run 150 cases to, find out the actual P50, P10, and P90 of the field, and to calculate the MEFs and do our <coughs> MEFs stands for minimum economical field size, because we had to um, calculate that for a um, prospect as well. And then to determine the criteria 
and understand what, it, what should be the outcome of this appraisal well. This slide is just showing you the ranges of the profiles uh, of the variables that we use for this study. And I will show you an example of how we called in the uh, three different uh, grids. They're basically, we use the variable grid num in the, <coughs> in the data file. And um, we only had three grids, but I'm sure that um, using the same method, you can call in as many as uh, uh, static grid that you like into the model. We have our contact, which it was another uncertainty. The range of contacts are, that we chose here, it was based on evidence on the other appraisal walls and the geological study that it was done with the, uh, by the geologist. We used the por uh, porosity multiplier to address the cementation. This is also based on the range that of all the appraisal walls that are drilled on sickness. The same thing with the permeability multiplier and uh, in the vertical direction as well, we had the K, KZ and we had the fault seal study as well, which we ranges between 0 0.1 to 1. I've, I've chosen uh, the distribution to be uniform for most of the, all the parameters apart for the permeability multiplier because I did an initial run with the uniform uh, distribution but I wasn't happy enough because I wasn't thinking that uh, for the Latin happy cube, cube it wasn't sampling the low side of the room uh, enough as much as I wanted it so I changed it to look normal and was much happier with that one. Typically for this size of a model, a model will run in 20 minutes. The 150 runs that I had, I think it took about an overnight to run it. That's why I could change my ranges and optimize my runs sometimes. So it didn't take that long. I think the full field signals model would take around two and a half hours to run as well. This is an example of how I called in my grid norm into my data file. Um, and it's because from another software, I had to integrate this data file in. I will call in my uh, different grids or a static model using this variable grid norm. Um, what I need to do at the end, uh, at, at the same time, I have to go into the include file. And um, because the grid file is coming with all the variables like porosity, permeability, regions, satnam, I have to go and change the include names in the same way that is called at grid num. And when I'm running it in the uncertainty um, and then um, in, your, in your include files, like for example, for porosity, you will have to <coughs> go in and uh, for example, for permeability, you have to go in and change your permeability like for the here for the low case, the include for, for file for the permeability, it should change to underscore one. And for the base case, it should be underscore two. And for the uh, high case is underscore three. And in the same manner, you will have to do this for all other includes such as porosity, deep num, I don't know, dimensions, everything. So you need to change that in order to call it in. And the beauty of it was that I could have as many as I wanted um, different static models to call in. And for the remaining variables that I had, basically I used the define again and we had the multipliers. I mean, the contact is the range that you decide and the uh, fault multipliers are was called like this and that's the range of it. But because I had a multiplier uh, on the permeability and porosity, I had to do some, I write some arithmetic to understand what this multiplier will do to my initial property. So like, for example, here I had the permeability and I multiplied it with the variable that I define here and that will do the job. And when you do all this, you just have to open your file or project, <coughs> excuse me, in the 
assisted history matching tool. And the first analysis that they run, as I mentioned, it was the tornado to do a sensitivity on my ranges on the parameters. And this is the plot on the gas in place from the tornado. Obviously, the gas in place is only contacted with the gas water contact, the grid and the porosity multiplier because the fault and the aquifer size and wouldn't impact it or the permeability multiplier. And you can see that um, the range, like if it was for the contact, the range of the model, uh, it was uh, on 50 to 180 and where is my base case. In the same manner, I had the tornado plot for the gas total production, which is basically my recovery for this block. And you can see, again, the gas water contact was coming up as the parameter or which it was impacting the production most. And the other one was the permeability multiplier, which was the second one that it was impacting my uh, recovery for this block. So I already knew that there are two things that are quite important here. One is the gas water contact and the other one is the quality of the block. Um, this is on the rate, gas rate, initial gas rate. Obviously, aquifer uh, plays a part here because the more water it comes into the well, your initial gas rate will be smaller here. And the uh, grid uh, had an also impact because on the low grid, I had a very flat structure. So you will have a lot more water production and less gas recovery. So I took from this parameter, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> from these parameters, I am that I run this uh, tornado or sensitivity analysis on, I've decided or we decided as a team evaluating this that we want to take the gas water contact, the grid and the porosity multiplier and permeability multiplier into our Latin Harbor cube or, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> Latin Harbor cube study. And we didn't take the KB multiplier or aquifer multiplier. And the reason was that we didn't think it had a huge impact and we thought that we can handle aquifer uh, multiplier or aquifer size outside of it after we decide like what is our base case. So P50, we will attach an aquifer and we do a couple of sensitivities on it to satisfy ourselves with the impact of aquifer. And we will save some time as well because we were on a rush to finish the project. So um, um, I've, we designed, we run the 150 cases and um, and this is the result on the 150 cases. Basically, you get that in the T Navigator. Um, it, it will tell you where is your P50, P90 with the lines and where is your P10. I plotted it here and in, these are in the pink circles. And um, I have plotted what was my base high and low deterministic case as also in the triangles. And you can see that for this project specifically, my P50 that it was coming out of the T navigator based on these 150 runs, it was quite close to the P deterministic case as well. But on the high side, maybe I was overestimating the project a bit. And uh, so based on this, we just choose this P10, P50, and P90 from this T navigator um, study. And um, this is the total gas production. Another view of it, it shows you what is your uh, profile, what is the actual profile that is coming out of this study. And for these three profiles that it was here, P90, P10, P50, I actually went in and I checked all the variables that it was like, a, I was used for to come out with this, um, prof, uh, for these profiles, because sometimes um, you might not be happy with what is chosen as a P50 from P Navigator because you don't like, for example, to use the grid num 
uh, I don't know, low grade for the P50. So, and you can choose another one which is quite close to the P50, but uh, is is uh, it's not it's not exactly the P50 that T Navigator is giving you, but it's P49, for example. But uh, it's choosing the right grade, so it, it was a good option that you could go and see what is the variable for this specific run, and. Um, we calculated the recovery factor based on the P50, P10, and P90 from the um, from this study and from these 150 runs. And basically, knowing that my uh, recovery factor will vary from 16% to 40 to uh, no 70% here. And I um, for this one, I did the economy myself because we have another tool in, I mean, you can pass it to your economist or you can do it quickly to calculate the minimum economical field size. And um, before I go to that, um, before I go to the economy, this is the, the thing that I said about the aquifer. We didn't want to run a lot in HarpyCube study on the aquifer, but I took the P50 that it was defined here this uh, case here, or the model, I extracted it from my 150 runs and I attached <coughs> an aquifer to it, which it was five times or 10 times higher than the initial aquifer that it was designed by the geologist. And um, to just see the impact of the aquifer and know what happens if it was the, the aquifer was 10 times bigger. Um, we see that the range of volume is changing from 30, I mean, from 40 on the initial case to <coughs> 30. So it's around 10 BCF different with the 10 times higher aquifer, which apparently, according to the geologists, is quite impossible to have that higher, big aquifer. And with the well we were having, it had around 35 meter stand up to fire, uh, free water level, which we think is <coughs> sufficient enough in signals for a horizontal well to delay water water breakthroughs, things like that. And as I mentioned, the, I used the sector model to do this study, but now I wanted to couple it back with the full field signals model to see what will be the impact on the other nine well production and the pipeline, because we have an eight inch tile subsea tie back here. So I needed to see what would be the impact on the eight inch tie back as well on the profiles. And I just basically used the coupling uh, method that is available in TNAV. You, uh, my, uh, my sector model was a slave. And as you can see, I just made this diagram here. And in Cygnus, we have, as I mentioned, we have all the PA, PB, uh, Alpha and Bravo platform. We were thinking about making a sub-C uh, tie back. That would be the sub-C um, production template or whatever you want to call it. And it will, um, I mean, by adding some keywords, I don't know if you're interested, I can show it to you later. But we just called in the well, uh, the sector model as a slave and uh, we run it as a fulfilled model to see what will be the impact on the <coughs> fulfilled uh, um, on, on the production, which I think about two BCF different with the, because of the extra pressure drop, uh, because of that eight kilometer distance between the subsea template and the production platform on Cygnus. But what it was beautiful that you could see that was like on a one plot, you could see the actual line wells on Cygnus production, the blue lines, and then what would be the impact on extension on the plateau on the and with this block, which is around six months, and it will add around 30 BCF recoverable to Cygnus field at the end of economical field life of Cygnus. And post this, I run all this for the P10, P50, P90 profiles. So I had a new profiles, which it was uh, subseed, uh, uh, which it was coupled with the full field model. And we go into the economical evaluation. And um, for this work, you need to have a post G, a geological chance of success to be defined by your geologists or the team that they're working on it. For this block, we assume that our post G is 100% because 
we think the risk of cementation is low and we already handled it in the assisted history matching tool because we applied some um, what you, uh, porosity multiplier into there as well. And we don't think the hydrocarbon is definitely there because the two blocks on the to, uh, east and west of this compartment, they already find hydrocarbon. And development option, as I mentioned, is the subsidy back. You just have to get the cost for it, which we did. And we've decided to go with the horizontal wall because I already uh, looked at the different wall types as well here. So we knew that the wall would be horizontal. A failure case here uh, will be a dry hole cost or the fact that your appraisal or the appraisal will cost because if the appraisal will doesn't find the criteria, you won't go further in this project. So that's what we define as a failure case here. And uh, using the profiles from this study, we calculate the MPV. And using an MPV, we could calculate our uh, minimum economical field size. And um, based on this minimum economical field size, it's possible to actually find what is the post E, which is the commercial chance of success for this block, because that's what we use in Neptune to see our projects. We don't use just the post G. We need to know what's the economical chance of success as well to calculate the EMV of the project. And um, I, I managed to associate the MEPS with the gas water contact as well, because based on the slides that I show you, you, you could see that gas water contact is one of the key things that uh, uh, will impact your production. And we actually use this gas water contact, which is uh, associated with the minimum economical field size to define, uh, call it the criteria for success, meaning that we need to find a specific gas water contact or a deeper contact uh, in order to call this well a success and go further in our evaluation. And uh, I just showed you quickly my, MEPS calculation, I mean, I have to change the Neptune price text and everything here because it's not for, I mean, it's not for other, um, so I just use the nominal gas price here to calculate this. And uh, I just use the MPV 10%, basically in Neptune or everywhere else, I suppose it's the same. We, we call the minimum economical field size when your MPV is equal to zero. And uh, I um, I find out that I need a gas in place of around ATBC, FT1 BCF with uh, uh, recoverable around 33 BCF, which is on this plot. This 33 BCF in the 150 run was associated with a model that had around 81 BCF in place. And that model had a contact of 3477. And this was our criteria for, defined criteria for success of this appraisal. We need to find a contact that is deeper than 3477 in order to go in a step further in our <coughs> development. Um, this is again that CDF or plot of all the, all the runs I had. And this is our, this is my MEPS, which was 33.4 BCF. And um, uh, this was associated with a P uh, or what you call percentile of 0 0.48. And this is what we call a pose E here. And um, the chance of economical chance of success, uh, which we define here is 40, 0, uh, 0 0.48 or 48%. And that's what we have used in our, I mean, in our EMV, which is basically because my pose G is one, it will be the pose E that we use in an EMV calculation here. I mean, in Neptune, we usually, when we put the numbers in the books, we do post truncation, meaning that I have to get rid of all these runs and uh, I will find a new P10, P50, P90 um, for my project but I don't go through this here because um, everybody does it differently here. And this is a decision tree 
that I created quickly based on my own runs. I knew the economical success will happen at, uh, when my gas or my MEP is uh, or gas in place or gas recoverable is actually higher than my MEPs. Uh, and chance of it is happening is around 48%. And economical chance of success is 48% and economical failure is 52%. And, I, and even if I have an economical success, I probably have three different scenarios, which is associated with the low, mid and high cases that I have again. And I used the normal distribution there and I calculated the EMV, which is the sum of all this for this project, which is 52.1. And I mean, we, we use this EMV and we compare this EMV value for all the blocks or all the other wells that you want to drill. And we probably go with the well or with the project that has the highest EMV. And for this one was 52.1. This one slide here is just showing you the contact versus the recovery factor. And you can see that how the contact and recovery, it's coming from the assisted history matching tool because you can create all these plots in that tool directly. And you can see that my contact has an, uh, how the, the contact is deeper, the recovery is higher. And what is the P50, P90, P10 contact? which you can use I mean, when you drill your well and you find your contact, you can see where you are basically. And without it, we had a strong correlation between the contact and EOR. And basically, if I go through the summary and conclusion of this study was that um, without using this approach, we could actually account for the dynamic uncertainty in addition to static ones. We had like 150 different realization we could do we could choose our P50, P90, and P10 with more confidence. We could do our truncation and rechoose our uh, profiles or the uh, to do more economics if we wanted. Um, and because I managed to do the sector model and the the tool itself was running quickly and I could in, I could call in different uh, static models, which it was building a different software. Uh, we managed to do this in a very limited time frame, so I didn't, we didn't need to do any, we didn't need to create any new models to use this tool. Uh, it was just to use those keywords. And it was great that we could use different uh, grids because the different grids, they had different surfaces and it was kind of, it was just integrate. It wasn't just on the dynamic side, so it was integrating the the geological model as well. We were uh, we could uh, identify the maps, a minimum economical fit size, more probabilistic in a probabilistic way, and uh, we could associate it with one of the variables that we defined, which was the contact, and we could use that contact in uh, to find out. Uh, to use it during the drilling to define the success of the appraisal stage. And um, we actually use this approach in um, one of the other prospects, or I don't know if you heard about it, Dogong, that uh, it was on the LinkedIn, to do a quick study as well on there. And we are happy about it because it's quite quick and it's kind of integrating everything together. And you just come out from the, I don't know, silo you sit in and you're doing stuff and you combine everything together and everybody is involved. And I thought I share it with you guys and hopefully you will use it. So, I think that's all I had to say. I don't know if Diego has anything to say or anyone else. Thank you very much, Anna, for the sharing the project with us today. Um, great presentation. Um, we have a little bit of time maybe for a couple of questions if there are any. So I'll just give the guys a few seconds to um, see if there's anything coming through. In the meantime, just to let everyone know that the next webinar will be next Thursday the 13th um, at the same time today. And the next one is with OPC and Nefin Energy. And it's pressure rate deconvolution and its use in the reservoir simulation of the core of gas field. So please join us again at the same time next week. Um, I'm going to let Diego and Anna do the questions. So Diego, is there anything coming through? So uh, I, can yes. see, I mean, I can see one question I says, 
Uh, was your porosity and permeability modifier entered as normal distribution? I think I already said something about it that I did the porosity modifier as a normal distribution, but I just chose the log normal one for the permeability multiplier. And you can check, I wasn't happy with how the room was sampled in a normal list. I actually think I used uniform for the porosity and the log normal for the permeability. I Wouldn't have you go uh, add anything to add. Yeah, no, no, no. I that's perfect, Anna. And there's another question that I think is more related to the software that I can answer. So there's a question: Can you dynamically create different phase distributions for each realization of the model? And yes, that is possible. Uh, to do that, you need to start the project from the model designer using workflows. So in that uh, way, you can define variables within the variogram, so you can create multiple uh, realizations of the, of the fascist distribution for each realization of the, of the model, and uh, that will be integrated with a dynamic model that will be initialized uh, after that. So yes, yeah, totally possible. Mm, I think you can also call your fascists in the same way, no, Diego? Like if you have created fascists in your other, I don't know, pre-owned or uh, pre-existing model, you can call in your fascists as an include file and change it, no? You can use different fascist distribution predefined as well. Yes, yeah, that yeah, is Yeah, because that's what they've done here. They call, yes, I call yes. in the fascist file, which was uh, created in another software, and I keep like calling them as an include file and I change them. So it's possible. That's also possible, yes. I don't yeah, see okay. any other question because I can make this big. I don't know if you see anything else. Yeah, we have we some have, more questions here. We have a few more, but we're probably um, a bit out of time for today. But if you did ask a question, we'll um, pull those together after and we'll make sure that they're answered and that you're contacted. Um, so, yeah, we will get in touch with you if your question wasn't answered because we do have a few coming through. Um, thank you very much, Anna and Nick Energy. Yeah. You're welcome. Thank you for joining us today. And we'll look forward to seeing you at the next webinar. Thank you, okay. everyone. Cool. Thank you. Bye. Bye.